to better understand our world, ourselves, and our future. This program is made possible by the people of Chevron. Chevron, giving thought to television. Millions of years ago, before man, before the ice ages, when the world was warm and humid, forests like these covered much of the earth. And it was here through eons of geological time that a profusion of life evolved. The remnants of these primordial jungles are the rainforests of today. They are home to half of all the animal species on earth. Yet in the shady depths of the forest, there is seldom more than a fleeting glimpse of this abundance. When they are seen, the animals are often revealed as strange and splendid examples of natural perfection and adaptation. diversity and sometimes bizarre in form, these creatures give the somber forest a special mystery and splendor. Endless rains and high temperatures create the steamy atmosphere in which rainforests thrive. These conditions occur now only in a narrow belt around the equator, where forests blanket some three million square miles of the Earth's tropics. Within this belt lies the small Central American country of Costa Rica, which possesses one of the richest natural endowments on Earth. When Christopher Columbus landed here in 1502, he found a mountainous land of rivers and forests like those he'd seen 10 years earlier in Hispaniola. Then, in what is perhaps the first description ever of a rainforest, Columbus wrote, its lands are most beautiful and filled with trees of a thousand kinds and tall, and they seem to touch the sky. And I am told that they never lose their foliage as I can understand, for I saw them as green and as lovely as they are in Spain in May. But it was partly from the early explorers that some popular misconceptions arose. For many, the first glimpse of a rainforest was from the rivers that flowed through them. The forest seemed impenetrable, a tangled mass of undergrowth through which a man could only hack a path with difficulty. 
But in reality, the dim interior is more open and usually easy to move about in. Little light penetrates the dense canopy, and so undergrowth is sparse. Only a thin layer of leaves covers the ground. A coral snake searches for a place to drink and finds enough rainwater in a curled leaf. The bright bands of color warn predators that it's poisonous. Below this thin layer of leaves lies the forest soil, and a paradox, for the luxuriant vegetation of a rainforest is often based on impoverished soil. The explanation lies in the way the forest recycles its nutrients. Dead trees and fallen leaves rot quickly, and the nutrients are rapidly reabsorbed by fungi and tiny roots near the surface. The entire system is so efficient a little is lost, and fully 95% of the rainforest's nutrients are held in the living vegetation, hardly any in the soil. To shed its old skin, the coral snake rubs its body against rough surfaces in the leaf litter. An arrow frog is courting a female. With his monotonous song, he will try to entice her to follow him under a leaf where they'll mate. the way. She follows. Within the shelter of a curled leaf, she lay her eggs, and the male will fertilize them. She has produced five eggs in a cluster of jelly and will stay nearby until they're ready to hatch. Workers from a colony of leaf-cutting ants are harvesting leaves to take back to their nests.
With their scissor-like jaws, they easily cut the leaves to manageable size. But some skill is needed for the next stage, when the leaf is hoisted into position for the journey ahead. For some, the problem may be too much help. For others, just a sudden puff of wind. But there are the exceptions. For most ants, it's only the first step in the long trek back to the nest, which may be a hundred yards or more away. They follow a chemical trail laid down by the workers that first scouted this tree, so they seldom go astray. The leaf fragments that they carry are not for eating. Instead, they are employed by the ants at a remarkable system of farming. The leaves are used to culture the fungus that is the only food source for the ants and their brood. Here in the underground garden, the leaves are cut into much smaller pieces and carefully cleaned, probably to remove any spores that might contaminate the pure culture. The leaf edges are chewed to a wet pulp a clear droplet of body fluid is added to create the perfect foundation for the precious fungus that sustains the colony. This is not the work of leaf cutter ants. The insects that create these patterns are seldom seen during the day. In daylight, insects are more vulnerable to predators, so many feed only at night leaving their mark everywhere in the understory of the forest. But some insects are active by day, and this morpho butterfly is a brilliant target for a jacamar. Before it can be swallowed, the wings must be removed. Great agility and keen eyesight make this anole lizard a formidable predator on small insects. Nearby, a female is shedding. Her old skin is too nutritious to be wasted. She eats every bit of it. The female is in his territory, and by staying, she shows that she is willing to be courted. He displays to her by flashing his brilliant dewlap a performance like this is both a signal to the female and proclaims his territory.
The female will remain here now, and they'll mate frequently over the next few days. Its body blending perfectly with the leaves, a praying mantis settles in a patch of sunlight created by a fallen tree. When a great tree falls, a gap is created in the forest canopy. It is in these sunny spaces that the forest regenerates itself. The seedlings of most forest trees cannot survive in shade. To flourish, they need light. So the competition for space around a fallen tree is intense. And for every sapling, there is a clinging vine competing for a place in the sun. But in this gap, there's a tree that always has clear growing space around it. This species of swollen thorn acacia has evolved a remarkable system of defense. For as soon as a sapling or vine touches it, ants that live on the acacia attack the intruder. They cross onto the touching vine and cut through its leaf stems. In a short time, their work is done, and the vine will lose its leaves, wither, and die. Most forest trees have evolved poisonous chemicals in their leaves to stop insects from eating them. But the acacia is edible and would soon be destroyed were it not for the vigilance of the ants. Any insect that lands on this acacia soon learns its error, for the ants bite and sting viciously. In return for their protection, the tree completely supports the ants. It secretes for them a sugar-rich solution, which they drink from little nectaries between the leaves. On the tips of some leaves in each acacia, unique structures are grown especially for the ants. They are rich in protein and vitamins and are taken by the ants to feed their larvae. It's here, within the large hollow thorns of the acacia, that the ants rear their brood. Some of these larvae will mature into fertile adults with wings and fly away to start another colony on a seedling tree. These young basilisk lizards forage along the river's edge. They live in the territory of this adult male, who tolerates them and probably fathered them. But he allows no other adult male to intrude here. This female is exclusively his.
Flowers are attractive to the leaf cutters as well, and many end up in the fungus gardens. Spider monkeys move as easily through the canopy as the puma through the forest's understory. Towering a hundred feet above the forest floor, the canopy harbors more tree-dwelling creatures than any other habitat on Earth. The treetops mingle and interlock to create a self-contained world. Many of its inhabitants never leave its sunny spaces to venture below. toed sloth feeds in the hot sun, while a mother carries her baby into the cool shade within the canopy.
A lie-in-wait lizard remains perfectly motionless. It's a strategy that serves it well. By keeping still, the lizard is overlooked by both predator and prey, and an unsuspecting victim can be pounced on from above. Rainforests seldom get less than a hundred inches of rain in a year. Some even exceed 400 inches. And so most of the leaves in the humid understory of the forest are specially adapted to drain water from their surface as quickly as possible. If water stays on them, the leaves may rot or become host to tiny plants that may do damage. These drip tips ensure that the leaves will dry quickly. The forest floor can usually absorb rain as it falls, but when the rains are particularly heavy, the forest becomes saturated and the water runs off to flood the surrounding rivers, flushing fallen trees and debris out to sea. line of rotting vegetation is left on the beach and a shy agouti forages among it for fruits. These paper wasps are drying their nest. Constructed of wood pulp, it would soon soak up the rain if the wasps didn't drink the water and spit it over the edge. The adults take so much care and trouble because in each of the cells is a developing wasp and their entire brood could be destroyed by a heavy downpour. As each larva grows, the wasps enlarge its cell by adding another layer of pulp and saliva to the outside rim. And when the nest begins to warm in the sun, they cool their brood by rapidly vibrating their wings to create a current of air. The eggs of a poison arrow frog have hatched, and the female carries two tiny tadpoles on her back. While they are developing into frogs, they have to be in water. 
She takes them up a tree to a site she has chosen in a bromeliad plant. She will deposit them in rainwater held in the bromeliad. She makes her way down a leaf to a small pool at its base. And here she submerges her tadpoles until they release their grip and leave her back. Tadpoles will complete their development in this tiny pool. In six to eight weeks, they'll emerge as frogs and return to the forest floor. Army ants are on the move. They build no permanent nests constantly comb the forest for their prey. This species preys only on the larvae of social insects, and here they attack a nest of paper wasps. In the face of such an onslaught, there is nothing the wasps can do. They abandon their brood to the voracious horde, which will soon strip the nest of all life. They take their plunder to a bivouac on the underside of a fallen log. Here, by linking special hooks at the ends of their legs, they form long hanging chains. Through sheer numbers, these strands mesh together to form the living fabric of the nest. Within the nest, strands of workers interlock to create chambers for the queen and brood. night, the forest teems with a different life. It's now that most of the leaf-eating insects emerge.
survive the ravages of insects, most plants have evolved toxic compounds that protect their leaves. But insects, in turn, have developed immunity to the chemicals. So together they have evolved insect and plant. Until now, most insects have become such specialized feeders that they can only eat the leaves of one particular plant or only one family of plants. This harlequin beetle spends most of its life as a larva concealed within dead wood. But now, as an adult, it emerges to find a mate. The beetle is host to a resident colony of mites that finds refuge in the creases and folds of its back. Also riding on the beetle are pseudoscorpions that prey on the mites. Held in the powerful jaws of the tarantula, the katydid has no chance, and its struggles soon cease. A stick spider suspends itself head down above a leaf on which its prey might walk. Its web is held by the tips of its four front legs. Green leaf frogs gather near a forest pool to mate. The males wait near the water to intercept the females as they arrive. Clasping the much larger female, the male will stay with her now until she has laid her eggs. She 
selects a leaf directly above the water. And as she lays her eggs, the male fertilizes them. Cat-eyed snake isn't interested in the frogs. He is after their eggs. And as egg-laying has been going on for several days, he will easily find others. Many snakes are attracted to the pool when the leaf frogs are laying. They eat almost all the eggs. Glass frogs also lay their eggs above water, in this case a stream. The male remains close to the eggs until they're ready to hatch. His presence probably deters flies and other insects that would harm them. On a rainy night, about two weeks after the eggs are laid, the vigil of the male ends, when the emerging tadpoles drop into the stream below. The frogs do not always manage to lay their eggs directly above water. However, the tadpoles are specially equipped with reflexes that help them cope with this situation. The first rays of sun warm the forest, and a mist rises up the great mountain mass that divides Costa Rica, separating the forests of the Atlantic coast from those of the Pacific. High in these mountains, the forest receives moisture from direct contact with the clouds, and the vegetation changes imperceptibly.
Many of the creatures found here can live only at these cooler heights. And it's here at the very top of the mountain that a rare mating ritual occurs. It takes place only during the few days of the year when contact of cloud and forest is at its greatest. When enough water has collected to form the few small pools in which golden toads lay their eggs. These toads occupy an area of mountaintop no greater than one square mile. They have been found nowhere else on Earth. The golden males gather at these pools and fight for possession of one of the drab females. Once firmly established on her back, the male is usually secure in his conquest and can easily repel any further challenge. Long strings of eggs are laid in the tiny pool, and if the misty weather persists long enough to maintain the pool, another generation of golden toads will be produced. Bellbirds announce their territories from the tops of the tallest trees. A pair of resplendent quetzals are digging out a nest in a dead tree. The males are considered the most beautiful birds in the Western Hemisphere. The ancient Mayas and Aztecs so revered the Quetzal that only royalty and nobility were allowed to wear the magnificent feathers in their ceremonial costumes. To kill the bird was a crime. They were simply caught and released after their long plumes had been plucked. Forests are going. At the present rate of destruction, most countries will lose their rainforests within our lifetime. And with the forests will go hundreds of thousands of unique and irreplaceable life forms that can survive nowhere else. Many will become extinct even before they have been described by science. 
their importance to nature's balance and their possible contribution to human welfare will never be known. But at last, some countries are beginning to realize that rainforests justify their existence simply by being there. And tiny Costa Rica, by its example, has become a world leader in conservation. One quarter of its land is given some measure of protection, and a full 8% is permanently protected in national parks. If other nations will follow Costa Rica's example, there is hope. But it is a race against time, because in the hour it has taken to view this film, some 3,000 acres of the world's tropical rainforest have been destroyed. We hope you have enjoyed this presentation from the National Geographic Video Library. Razor sharp teeth, fearsome jaws, the shark is every swimmer's nightmare. I've been bitten twice by sharks and once it was quite nasty. But have we created a deadly myth? I want people to understand that the danger from shark attack is so slight that they don't have to worry about it. Are sharks the victims of our imagination and fear? Find out when National Geographic takes you into the shadowy realm of the sharks. Count three, go. In two. Between 1968 and 1972, 24 men left the Earth and journeyed to the moon. This is the film they brought back, and these are their words. Stand by for touchdown. This is gonna be spectacular. I felt uh, at home there, even though the Earth was a long ways away. Look at the size of that rock. Good deal, boy. 
there is new knowledge to be gained and new rights to be won for the progress of all mankind. Join National Geographic for a wondrous journey into the unknown. Man must explore. For all mankind.